Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12. And we'll give you a £20 Amazon gift voucher absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher. Hello and welcome to Spectator Out Loud. Every week we pick a few of our writers from the issue and get them to read out their pieces to you. This week we're going to be joined by editor of The Spectator's US edition, Freddie Gray, who writes about who the real Joe Biden is. And then it will be joined by Douglas Murray, who talks about this new world in which allegations are made that can't be proved or disproved. And at the very end, Katie Balls, our deputy political editor, talks about the government's fears of a second wave. First up, it's Freddie Gray. It is usually a bad idea for a presidential candidate to leave himself open to the accusation that he is soft on law and order. Yet last weekend, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. did exactly that. He attacked the egregious tactics of the federal officers trying to control the apparently never-ending riots in Portland, Oregon. Sensing an open goal, President Trump's campaign promptly accused Biden of siding with the criminals. In any normal election year, such an exchange would be a major flashpoint. In the COVID-19 riddled anarchy cauldron that is America in 2020, nobody much cares. Joe Biden can say pretty much anything, or nothing at all, and his lead in the polls just grows and grows. There's now fewer than 100 days until the presidential election. America's cities are still burning, and the 77-year-old challenger who has no idea what he is saying is thrashing the 74-year-old president who has no idea what he is saying. The Chinese must be quaking. Team Trump are quick to insist that as November draws closer and voters begin to focus on the still presumptive Democratic nominee, the dynamics of the race will shift in their favour. Biden has kept a low profile, in large part thanks to the pandemic. As the media scrutiny intensifies, his weaknesses as a candidate will become too glaring, his incipient dementia too embarrassingly obvious. The trouble is, the Trumpies have been saying that for months now, and Biden just keeps plodding ahead. It's increasingly clear that Trump doesn't know how to grapple with doddery old Joe. The president is flailing. In an effort to peel off a few black voters, his talking heads are saying that Biden is racist because he gave a eulogy for the infamous Dixiecrat Senator Storm Tamond and made some un-PC remarks in the 1990s. At the same time, they say he'd be the most hopelessly woke commander-in-chief it's hard to square these differing images. The Trump campaign has for now apparently given up on targeting Joe directly. The president and his spinners are going after the more left-wing democratic governors and mayors who have shut down their states and cities in response to the pandemic while pandering to the protester mobs. That's an admission of defeat. Biden has been called a Teflon candidate, but that doesn't quite do justice to his slipperiness. He's almost sphinx-like. His low visibility campaigns means he can represent different things to different Americans. To working class whites, he's regular Joe, the Irish Catholic boy from Scranton, Pennsylvania. To black voters, he's Barack Obama's loyal vice president, who's always had that Clintonian knack of sounding empathetic. To suburban women, he's the elder statesman who will bring back decorum to the Oval Office. To former Republicans and independents, he's not Donald Trump. To tantrum-throwing revolutionaries, he's a pushover in waiting. Biden's campaign logo features his famous aviator sunglasses, and what could be more American? But those reflective shades are also quite a good metaphor for Biden's candidacy. You see what you want. Biden's legislative priorities are similarly elusive. His campaign is adept at sounding radical without committing to anything controversial. This month... He has promised to rip the roots of systemic racism out of this country and transform this country. Exactly how, he doesn't say. On his website, the Joe's Vision section features more than 40 plans or agendas. These include the Biden plan for climate change, the Biden plan to end violence against women, and Joe Biden's agenda for the Catholic community. It's all very repetitive. Joe Biden will ensure everyone is treated with dignity, no matter their race, gender, sexual orientation, religion or disability, Team Joe declares on every page. After 15 minutes reading this platitudinous dross, I searched in vain for Joe's plan for the board senseless. 
inclusivity has its limits. The worry among conservatives and moderates is that President Biden would be a Trojan horse for the hard left. He's so old that it seems unlikely he will be able to preside fully over one term, let alone two. Biden has already invited Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the 30-year-old starlet of American progressivism, to help formulate his policies. Would he let the young radicals take charge? Probably not. A quick look at the front ranks of the Democratic Party offers proof as to how tightly the gerontocracy grips its power. In the House of Representatives, the Speaker is Nancy Pelosi, aged 80. The Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer, is 81. And the Majority Whip and key Biden ally, Jim Clyburn, is 80. Retail politics is their modus operandi. Revolution is not. In the coming days, Biden will announce his vice presidential nominee, which, given his infirmity, could prove a momentous decision. He may well be picking the next commander-in-chief. He has promised that he will choose a woman, and the indications are that it will be a black woman. Kamala Harris, Val Demings, Karen Bass and Susan Rice are considered favourites. Biden may gamble on an outsider, as did his late friend John McCain, the Republican nominee in 2008, in choosing Sarah Palin, the mother of five, governor of Alaska. Considering his big lead in the polls, it seems more likely that Biden will plump for a do-no-harm running mate. Somebody who ticks the identity boxes but doesn't upset the wrinkled hierarchy. What is certain is that Biden is willing to spend vast amounts of federal money. The Trump administration has already thrown six trillion at the COVID-19 crisis. Biden wants much more. Whatever it takes, he says. He also proposes to increase government health care spending dramatically. And his answer to racism is more tax credits for black small business owners, plus a hundred billion fund for affordable housing for African-Americans. Some observers are concerned about Biden's head for figures. He recently claimed that America had over 120 million dead from COVID. In a debate earlier this year, he said 150 million Americans have been killed by gun crime. Never mind, it's only Joe. He won't be doing the sums. Progressives are growing excited at the possibility that Biden might surprise everyone by becoming the next Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That is, he'll put America back to work after the ravages of COVID in the way that FDR rebuilt the US economy after the Great Depression. Biden is indeed mooting a Green New Deal to save America and, as luck would have it, the planet at the same time. But Obama, who also came to power in a crisis, promised much the same 12 years ago and left America and the world disappointed. The only hope that Biden will do better is, curiously, the lack of hope he brings. He is in no way burdened by the great expectations that accompanied the arrival of the first African-American president in 2009. Biden offers at best a dim memory of the optimism that Obama inspired, as well as the prospect of relative calm after four turbulent years of Trump. His election will be the democratic equivalent of a giant sigh. Biden's greatest strength is that unlike Trump, he is widely held to be a good man. He has suffered. In 1972, he lost his wife and daughter in a car crash, and in 2015, his son Beau to brain cancer. Americans admire nothing more than triumph over adversity, and Joe is arguably at his best when talking about grief. His ability to emote helps blunt the other Trumpian attack line, that Biden is corrupt. As vice president, he appears to have helped his other son, Hunter, make highly lucrative deals in China and Ukraine. Joe was also apparently complicit in the shady attempt to thwart Trump's presidency by using the FBI to spy on his campaign. For some reason, nobody wants to believe that the affable old boy is guilty of such crimes. Yet one of the reasons the Obama-Biden administration ended in the ascension of Trump was that Americans were sick of the venality in Washington, the swamp that gets rich selling out America's interests. It's hard to imagine that Biden, who used to be known as the senator from MBNA because of his lobbying efforts on behalf of the credit card industry, would lead an altogether pure administration. It's worth noting that the Chinese parent company of TikTok, the social media app which Trump's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has suggested should be banned on national security grounds, has hired key Democratic operatives with links to Biden ahead of the November election. The Biden campaign this week forced staffers to delete TikTok from their phones. The Democrats know that they cannot afford to let Trump make them look weak on China, which, thanks in no small part to COVID, is now clearly established in the minds of voters as foreign adversary number one. 
the Biden line is that Trump is being played by Beijing. It's difficult, however, to deny Biden's record of accommodating China as vice president under Obama. A President Biden would be more internationalist in outlook than Trump has been. That would make him more likely to take military action than Trump, who, for all his apparent hot-headedness, should be given credit for not having started a new war. Biden, by contrast, has supported just about every foreign intervention America has embarked upon in the past 30 years. For him, restoring the soul of America may well mean bombing somewhere to bits. He would also look to revive the multilateral trade agreements that Trump so rudely junked. At first blush, Biden's victory might seem bad news for Brexit Britain, since Trump has always made such positive noises about our departure from the European Union. But Brexiteers have become pessimistic about achieving the beautiful, beautiful US-UK trade deal that Trump has long promised. There is now growing excitement that under Biden, the United States and the United Kingdom might join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, now renamed the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, to form the world's greatest trading bloc. Besides, the political class only likes dealing with the political class, and most Tory MPs would be happier working with Biden appointees than the wild characters from the Trump administration. Under Biden and Boris, the bonds of the Obama and Cameron administrations might be re-established. Both countries can happily go back to hawking their interests to Beijing. The civil unrest in America will abate, at least temporarily, and everybody will forget about those chaotic years when Donald Trump was in charge. Keep on rocking in the free world. That was Freddie Gray, and now Douglas Murray. The case of Johnny Depp versus The Sun, heard over recent weeks at the High Court in London, certainly gives fresh life to the old warnings about dirty linen and its public laundering. Whatever the results, I would be surprised if it didn't provoke others to think again about the wisdom of reverting to the law. The influencers, formerly known as the Sussexes, for instance, must be wondering whether their forthcoming legal case will result in them solely being showered with praise. Of course, one has sympathy for famous people who feel that they have been badly portrayed. It is unpleasant to read nasty things about yourselves in the newspapers, especially if you have spent years reading largely pleasant things, carefully placed there by yourself or your PR team. Still, the urge should be resisted, and almost all precedent, even before the Depp trial, shows why. Unless you have been falsely accused of a crime such as murder, taking legal action is always like stepping in quicksand. The absence of this realisation is one reason why the young and unworldly imagine that the courts are a good place to settle their complaints. The misunderstanding comes from lack of experience, lack of knowledge of how much can go wrong, and a zero understanding of the fact that even exoneration leaves some residue of the thing of which you were accused. Earlier this decade, during one of their frequent leadership contests, a man called John Rhys Evans stood to be that week's UKIP leader. Several years before, he had made a joke about a gay donkey trying to rape his horse. The joke was not golden, and the candidate apologised when it resurfaced. Yet he could not shake it from his person. Headline writers consistently scorned the opportunity to describe his policies, foreign or domestic. Instead, he was only ever introduced with a Scrabble entry variously involving the words gay, rape, man, donkey, horse and UKIP. As word slates go, the one associated with him was particularly suboptimal. Of course, Rhys Evans could have sued... But had he done so, the words most associated with his name would not have been magically disassociated from it. More likely, it would have embedded the existing word association. This is a version of the conundrum that must run through every would-be plaintiff's head. Our own time brings an added complexity, which is that while being erroneously accused of rape or murder allows you to prove your innocence... The most damaging things of which a person can be accused today can, in most cases, be neither proved nor disproved. Consider the most damaging contemporary charge of all, that of racism. 
When it comes to this allegation, there is no agreed-upon definition, no definitive means for it to be disproved, and no punishment for its false levelling. Many cultural oddities of our time can be traced back to this curious, yet rarely reflected upon fact. I recently got a little reminder of this when a lecturer in post-colonial literature at Cambridge University called Priyamvada Gopal tweeted out the phrase, White lives don't matter. A number of people were unthrilled by this statement and made their views known. Naturally, Gopal immediately went about accusing all her critics, including me, of being racists. She then spent her weekend firing out late-night threats, claiming that lawyers' letters would be imminently wending their way in my direction, as towards all her other detractors. At this point, Twitter promptly revealed even more unpleasant tweets sent out by Gopal over recent years. These included her claim last year that she struggles every day to resist her urges to kneecap white men. In the wake of this controversy, Gopal strangely made her Twitter account protected so that no unapproved people could read her ravings, and Cambridge promoted her to a full professorship. To date, I have still received no communication from Professor Gopal's lawyers, and I suspect that this is for the same reason that her pigeonhole has remained unbothered by any communications from mine. For, while I presume that both Professor Gopal and I could try to sue each other, it would be in neither party's interests to do so. If she wished to try to prove that my distaste for her style of communication is based solely and knowingly on a dislike of her racial origin, then I suppose she would have to prove that there is no other reason to criticise her. And if I chose to argue in court that I was a victim of racial discrimination at the hands of Professor Gopal, then I suppose I would have to rely on getting a jury subtle enough to recognise that a victim of racism might be a white writer as much as it might be a non-white academic. None of this personally bothers me overmuch, because I still have the opportunity to explain myself in public and say what I actually think to the best of my ability. What does worry me is the fact that most people can have no hope of such recourse. Now that the bookshops have reopened, I have wandered around a couple, depressed to see them piled high almost exclusively with books scolding customers for their alleged racism. I can think of a fair few things I would like to say about this, but what would I dare say if I was just another customer rather than a customer and an author with outlets? The words bookshop, rant and racist are just waiting to be used against anybody who makes any criticism of this latest hectoring. And, once attached, there would be no way to remove the stain. The public would not care. Employers would be unlikely to stand by the accused and, if anyone even dreamt of going to the law, they would have to raise vast sums of money to try to disprove something that would ignite a headline salad to make John Rhys Evans's one look enviable. I don't know what the way out of this societal conundrum is. Lawyers tell me that it requires innocent plaintiffs to make case law, which is all very well. But the problem with legal precedents is always the same. Who would want to be the one to make them? That was Douglas Murray and now Katie Balls. As the government struggled on Saturday with the question of whether to impose a quarantine on those returning from Spain, there was a hold-up. A key minister was unavailable. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps was on a holiday flight to Spain and hadn't landed yet. When Shapps eventually made it onto the Zoom call from his holiday villa, one person who sat in on the meeting was surprised by the speed at which the quarantine decision was made. After being stung by accusations that the government moved too slowly in its initial handling of the pandemic, Boris Johnson now wants to show it is moving quickly. The Spanish quarantine, which is more draconian than the approach is taken by France or Germany, shows the Prime Minister is prepared to enforce heavy restrictions with little warning, even if this means a backlash from business leaders and his own MPs. 
With a spike in recorded infections in European countries, such as Belgium and France, Johnson this week warned that the signs of a second wave of the pandemic are here. But it's not the prospect of having to extend the travel quarantine to other tourist hotspots that is giving the government great cause for concern. It's the fear that the second wave could soon hit these shores. Throughout the coronavirus crisis, the government has been observing how other countries have dealt with the pandemic, looking for clues about what to do and what not. The spike in infections in the southern states of the US was taken as a warning about opening up too quickly. But now that Germany, which adopted a more cautious approach about lifting lockdown and leads the way in testing, has also reported an uptick, some worry that any substantial easing risks a spike. The Prime Minister began the summer with optimism and a desire to return to his domestic agenda, but ministers report that in recent weeks his concern has grown over the prospect of a second spike. Johnson has publicly downgraded his optimism for the country, returning to normal. Two weeks ago, he said he hoped the last remaining restrictions could be lifted by November. Now it's the middle of next year. He has warned business leaders that there will be more to come from the coronavirus crisis this year. The timing of a second wave is a huge concern for Whitehall. One figure involved in the pandemic planning from the start is recalling the early warnings about the risks of too strict a lockdown with a sense of dread. Chief Scientific Officer Patrick Valance suggested in March that clamping down too hard could see the virus return at the wrong time. A winter crisis and a second wave together is almost unthinkable, a government advisor tells me. Discussions are underway as how best to avoid any surge in cases. The aim is to do all it takes to avoid a second national lockdown, which is viewed as catastrophic by the government. There are two main reasons for this. Firstly, lockdown measures would be harder to enforce in the winter. It's one thing asking the elderly to queue outside a supermarket in May. It's another on a cold night in November, a minister tells me. Secondly, in the words of one government figure, it would spell economic Armageddon. Ministers have already started to consider their arguments in the event that some things have to close in order for others to open. The schools or pubs dilemma, as it is known in Whitehall. The public backlash over the failure to get children back in the classroom before summer means there is a sense in government that schools must be fully open in September, even at the cost of closing other things down. If schools aren't back, our core voters would not forgive us, warns one minister. However, the large amount of social contact in and around secondary schools is a problem. In Israel, public health officials have blamed the decision to reopen schools in May for July's spike in infections. The two tools at the government's disposal to prevent a second national closure are test and trace and local lockdown. In number 10, hope is being placed on an increase in testing capacity. But with no contact tracing app still, there is only so much good it can do. While polls suggest the public broadly support Johnson's whack-a-mole strategy of local lockdowns, MPs are sceptical about its long-term popularity. It's like public support for tax rises, says one Tory MP. People say they back them because they don't think they'll be the ones paying. People support local lockdowns until they are the ones in it. He may have a point. Neil O'Brien, MP for Harborough in South Leicestershire, was initially very supportive of the government strategy, but that slowly changed as Leicester's lockdown dragged on for nearly a month. A government loyalist, he has been reduced to adding hashtag let us out to his tweets. A source of frustration among those affected by local lockdowns is that there are no objective criteria of what triggers or maintains local lockdown. In a recent meeting with a cross-party group of MPs, the Health Secretary and Dido Harding, head of Test and Trace, were insistent that there could be no one-size-fits-all set of guidelines as there are too many factors to consider. However, without such clarity, MPs worry there will be local anger about why an area has been locked down. There is also a concern that there could be community tensions if whole towns have been shut when the problem is only in certain neighbourhoods. Places currently in local lockdown still have access to emergency economic relief. Despite this, local business owners can feel as though they face a severe disadvantage. It will be even worse when the furlough scheme ends, predicts one MP. The Treasury is reluctant to come up with any general local lockdown relief packages on the grounds there is no way of knowing how many times these measures would be required. Of course, Johnson's great hope remains that the structures in place work, that more lockdown scenarios do not come to pass, and the virus remains under control. But if this happens, the UK would be an outlier in success.
After a difficult four months in which Britain has lagged behind other countries, it is perhaps understandable that there is not much optimism across government. That was Katie Balls. Thanks for listening to this podcast. As ever, do email us at podcast at spectator.co.uk to give us your thoughts. But what's even better than that is if you rate and review and subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts from, because that helps more people to discover it. Thanks for listening and join us again next week. Get 12 weeks of The Spectator in print and online for just £12. And we'll give you a £20 Amazon gift voucher absolutely free. Go to spectator.co.uk forward slash voucher.